Amen and amen. Good morning, everybody. All righty. So how are we all doing this morning? Could not have asked for a more perfect day, a more beautiful day. And uh, good morning in the back there. So good to see you guys. Uh, I'll be honest, if I was coming to church this morning, I would have picked the seat in the corner, in the back. Just, I love it back there. The whole week, I was just sort of walking around back there. It is absolutely awesome. It is so good to see you guys. Let me say this before we do anything else. I want to thank everybody that has worked so, so hard to make today happen. Um, just the team has worked tirelessly. Everybody is so excited. And, uh, and as you can see, it is, it's been a beautiful time so far this morning. And how cool is this? We're on the screens. I mean, I've told you now for about a year how good looking I am. <laughs> and I've seen, I, I can feel sometimes like there's like, you don't really believe me, but we zoom in a little bit on this. <laughs> Apps, I mean, you're welcome, ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> this morning. But... Uh, as, uh, as I was thinking about today, and I was, as I was thinking just about all the anticipation around Easter Sunday, I could not help but think about one of the greatest moments I had as about, I think I was about eight or nine years old. It was one of the greatest moments for me as a kid, and it involved two things that I loved at that point more than probably anything else in the world, and that was pizza and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I really, for the longest time in my life, hoped and believed that I would become a Ninja Turtle. Now, my body shape has somewhat gone there, but um, otherwise I am still human, which is a little disappointing. But I'll never forget, there was a competition hosted by our local Pizza Hut, and Pizza Hut was running a competition where they were essentially sending out these little things where you could color in the Ninja Turtles, and the grand prize was something pretty awesome. I can't really remember what it was. But it was the second prize that I was interested in. Because the second prize was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles skateboard. And I was also going through my 10-minute skateboard phase at that point. So it was just the, it was this incredible all the worlds coming together. Pizza, Ninja Turtles, skateboarding. I mean, it was just incredible. And... I put in the time, I put in the effort, I did this great thing. I remember I actually wrote Pizza Hut on the little pizza box the turtles had in the picture. I was so excited about it. I sent in my form and we waited and we waited and we waited and I forgot about it completely. And one day this man shows up at the house and uh, he comes to the front door, knocks at the door. My mom opens up. She says, uh, you know, good morning, sir. What is this all about? And he says, I'm from Pizza Hut. And I'm like, this is interesting. What is happening? He then proceeds to say, I've come out here today to break the bad news that unfortunately Mark did not win the grand prize for the Pizza Hut competition. And I just, you know, I just felt my heart sort of sank. I felt disappointed. But at the same time, there was a part of me that went, but why? Man, how great is Pizza Hut? Are they sending pizza people out just to announce to everybody they didn't win? And then he turns around and he goes, but I actually do have a little bit of good news. He actually won second prize in the competition. And I lost my little mind because I was like, sir, you don't understand. I don't want your bad grand prize. I want the skateboard. And he pulled out the skateboard and... Uh, you want to know how special that moment was for me? I decided on this Easter Sunday to use that as my opening illustration. Um, that's how meaningful the Ninja Turtle skateboard moment was for me. But I'll never forget in the moment how it felt like disappointing news when I heard I didn't win. But then it was the greatest unexpected news I had ever received in my entire life. And I want to speak to you a little bit this morning about, about Jesus, I'm going to talk about the disciples, and we're going to talk to you about the greatest unexpected news mankind has ever received. And my heart and my hope is that even this morning as you sit here, 
you are about to experience the greatest unexpected news maybe you ever have had in your entire life. So let's go to our text. It's Matthew 28, verse 1 to 7. After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The gods were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. So I need you to pay attention here. The angel knew what the expectation um, of, the, of the woman were as they come to the tomb. They knew what the pre-expectations were, and they're essentially saying, your expectations, unfortunately, are not going to be met this morning. They go on by saying this, Jesus, whom you are looking for, is not here. He has written, he has risen. That's the one thing I messed up this morning. He has risen. <laughs> Just a pretty face. <laughs> let's try that again. Roll the tape. Let's rewind the tape. <laughs> Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. <laughs> Just as he said, come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. And uh, I, what I want to do for the rest of our time this morning is I want to speak through expectations and want to speak about the fact that this is the greatest unexpected good news in all of mankind. And we're going to start with the first phrase as the angel looks to Mary. The first thing he says is this. The angel says, Jesus is not here. Um, what you are looking for, you are not going to find. I did a little bit of research on this in the week. And essentially what these ladies were hoping for, this was the expectation, this was their hopes. They were hoping that they would find the dead body of Jesus in the tomb, and they were hoping that they could actually anoint the body of Jesus. And as I read a little bit, I, I was trying to find out what is the significance of anointing a dead body, why would you want to do this, why was this so important, and there's a couple of different reasons why they would have done it. But one of the accounts that I read this week said that part of, anointing, part of the anointing ritual was in the hopes of keeping the decay and the stench of death away from the body for as long as possible. I don't, I don't want to be funny, but this is a very low, very sad, if you think about it, expectation. On that morning when these ladies get up, um, they are feeling absolutely uh, saddened. Uh, th there's been this tragedy. Jesus, whom they love, has been taken away from them. And they are now left in a place where the only hope they have, the only expectations they have, is the hope or the expectation of anointing a dead body. And the hope is that somehow, maybe, possibly, they can just keep the stench of death off of this body for another day or two. To their surprise, they get to the tomb, and Jesus absolutely fails them in their expectation of anointing a dead body. The unexpected good news was that Jesus can do way more than your expectations, and I want to start with that this morning. I want you to know that Jesus can do way more than your expectations. And I really feel and I really believe that as I look at the culture we're in, as I gauge society, as I have many conversations, as I look at the mood in the country, as I speak to individuals, I feel like we have found ourselves in a place as a society where our expectations of what life is and what life could be is low. 
Dare I say it this morning, but I feel like for some of us, we've lost hope to the point in our own lives that the best we can hope for is to keep the decay of death away for another day or two. We've been hurt. We've been disappointed. Life has mistreated us. You have gone to the McDonald's drive through one too many times and ordered a McFlurry where they told you the machine is not working. You were shocked and you were hurt and you were horrified on that summer day, but somehow you expected it. Somehow you knew it was not going to work. And I truly believe that some of us have gotten to the place where even this morning coming to church, you're looking good, you're dressed up, you've got the family with you. But if you have to be honest with yourself, if you have to be truthful, your expectations of what God can still do in your life and what God is doing in your life is not where it should be. For a lot of us today, we are essentially exactly where these ladies were at. You, just like the woman on their way to the tomb, have expected death in your life, and you are just trying to keep the stench of death at bay another day or two. I want you to know that Jesus is not in the tomb of hopeless expectations. He's not there. You might be there, and you might be looking for him there, but I've got bad, good news for you this morning. He is not in that tomb. Jesus has left the tomb of hopeless expectations. He has a hope, and he has a future for you. John 10, verse 10, says it this way. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy and this is what I'm talking about this morning. We've experienced this in our own lives. We've experienced the pain of death in our lives. We've experienced the pain of disappointment, of sickness, disease, betrayal. Sin has robbed us. It has bankrupted us. And for a lot of us, we've just found ourselves in this place where that now is the expectation we live by. But listen to what Jesus says. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it in full abundance. Jesus is not in despair this morning. We don't have to live in a place of hopeless despair either. I want you to look up from the tomb you've been staring at because Jesus is not there. The unexpected good news today is that we can have hope for the future. So the next question we need to answer then is this. If Jesus is not in the tomb of hopeless expectations, where is he exactly? And the angel says this. The angel says, Jesus whom you are looking for is not here. Where is he? He is risen. If you really think about it, positive expectations are a little bit like potential. Potential gives us the idea that the future is going to be exciting. Typically, when we look at potential, we are looking at a person. We look at people and we go, that person has potential. In other words, I have a high expectation of where this person's life is potentially going. At eight years old, when I won that coloring in contest for Pizza Hut, there was a level of potential in my life for the artist I could be. Um, I could be sitting on a bridge in France right now, sketching people eating baguettes. Um, I did not live up to my artistic potential. And that is unfortunately the problem with potential. That is sometimes the problem with expectations. Expectations don't always go the way we hope. Potential does not always go the way that we hope. But the fact that Jesus has risen from the dead means that we have moved away from the potential of good news. And we are now living and experiencing the reality of that good news. It's not just the potential. It's not just the expectation of a hope and a future, but it is the reality of it. Why? Because not only is he not in the tomb, but he has risen. He has conquered the grave. He has conquered death. Let's get, let's get real for just a second here today, and, and I think this is the biggest thing we need to look at today is this. I don't care how tough you are sitting in this room today. 
But every single one of us, if we have to get real about death, when we think about death, when we get real about death, it gives us pause in our life. I think if we have to be real and if we have to lean into our humanness, if that is even a phrase, the reality is, is that death gives us something to be fearful of. Death makes us nervous. Every single one of us in this room, at some point or another, we've had a clash with death. We've had an encounter with death. Some of us sitting in the room have lost loved ones. People that were close to you, people that you love dearly are no longer with you because of this enemy of death. Some of you have had encounters, close encounters with death yourself. I remember when I was a little boy, and uh, I did not necessarily grow up in a religious household, but I remember just loving my mom and dad so much, loving my brother, loving my life, and I remember trying to, as a little boy, wrap my head around death. I know, morbid thinking. When I wasn't winning pizza contests, this is where my head was. And, um, and I, just, I, couldn't, I could not fathom it as a kid. I, I just could not, I could not wrap my head around this idea of there will come a point one day in your life where you will be ripped away from everything that you love. And when you are ripped away from everything that you love, you'll be cast into the vast open space of the nothingness. And that is where you will be for the rest of eternity. I could not, I could not deal with it. I would hyperventilate. I would feel panicked. I would run to my mom in tears and I would say to my mom, mom, I just, I need something from you now. I need you to, I don't want to leave you. I don't want you to leave me. I don't, I don't understand this thing called death. How can I love the way I do? And then this is in my future. I don't understand it. And my mom would do everything in her power to try to calm me down. And she would to talk to me about, think about good things and think about positive things. And then as you get older, you kind of get a little bit more used to death. And, and then after a while, you'll hear things like, well, death is normal. Death is just a part of life. And what we try to do is, is we try to accept it as much as we can. I want to I wanna push back on that thought a little bit today. And I want to say this to you. What if I were to tell you today that I don't think it is normal, actually? What if I were to tell you this morning that I don't actually think death is normal? What if I were to tell you that I don't think actually it is just acceptable? You see, if death is so normal, then why is everything in us wired for survival? Why is it that instinctively we will do everything we can to get one more day in this world? Why is it that every living, breathing creature on the face of the planet, all the way from the fly in my kitchen on a hot summer day that I am trying to hunt down like Rambo, why is it that even that fly will scrap for every last little inch of survival, including all of us? I need to ask you today, if death is so normal and so acceptable, why does it give us pause? Why do we struggle? Why does the zebra run away from the lion in the wilderness? Why does it not just give up its breath and let the lion eat? I'll tell you why. Because we were made for eternal life. We were designed for eternal life. We were made in the image of our creator in his likeness. And God is eternal. And God's plan is that we would be together with him for all of eternity. And the reality is, is that death kicks against that. Death steps into God's ideal plan and it tries to rob us and it tries to steal from us and it puts us in a place where everything is disrupted. But here is the unexpected good news that you need to hear this morning, that this age-old enemy of death, this thief that would rob you, this, this murderer that would come and take everything from you, as helpless as we are to conquer this enemy, this thief, Jesus conquered the enemy of death and he did it for every single one of us. Listen to this today. 2 Corinthians 4, verses 12 to 16, it says this, So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken, since we have that same spirit of faith. This is anticipation. 
This is expectation. We also believe and therefore speak because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Even in the face of persecution, even in the face of death, we do not lose heart. Why? Through outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. The Bible is telling us today that because Jesus has risen from the grave, those that believe in him will also be resurrected. That great enemy of death has been defeated and that is the greatest unexpected good news in the world. The unexpected good news is that we can have eternal life because Jesus defeated death. So here we are this morning, and we're looking all pretty. And the question now is, so what do we do with all of this? What do I do with this information? What do I do with my expectations of a hope and a future? What do I do with the fact that Jesus lived a perfect life and died for me so that I now might have eternal life? What do I do with all this? And we're going to go to the last thing that the angel said. The angel said, he's not here. The angel said, he is risen. And then the angel said, just as he said. The angel tells us that this miraculous thing happened exactly the way he said it would happen. You know, I was thinking about this in the week, and I can't help but feel like this little statement right here is probably the most overlooked statement when it comes to the resurrection of Jesus. We focus a lot on the fact that Jesus actually rose from the dead but I don't know how much time we actually spend on the fact that he said he would, and then he did. Let me, let me try to paint you a picture this morning to illustrate what I'm talking about. So imagine for a moment that after church today, you go home and you have lunch, and uh, you take maybe a little bit of a nap. And imagine, you know, Chris and Jacob call me out, and they're like, hey, where are you at? And I go, well, I'm at home. And they go, listen, do you want to go play some baseball? And I'm like, sure thing. And the three of us hop on our bikes, and we ride down to the local park. And the three of us start playing a little bit, bit of baseball, and Chris Burns decides that he's going to bat, and he's going to stand at plate, and I'm going to, you know, pitch, and I'm going to throw a couple of balls at him. And we're busy playing and messing around, and I throw a ball at him, and next thing, Chris Burns gets a hold of one. But you can hear, oh, it is crisp. You can hear the crack of that baseball off of the bat. And I look around, and Jacob looks around, and that thing just goes soaring. Chris just hit a 400-foot bomb out into left field. And as this thing is soaring through the skies, lightning comes from nowhere and strikes that baseball, and it explodes in midair. Now, I'm just telling you what would happen. If that happened this afternoon while we were playing baseball, I would look at Jacob or Chris and I'd be like, ah! I would literally just scream. We would run up to each other. We would do a weird three hug thing and just like jump up and down like this. We would be like, this is the coolest thing that's ever happened. I can't believe this happened. This is unbelievable. This is so cool. This is so awesome. And I would tell everybody about it. I would tell you the next Sunday in a sermon about this thing that happened. And probably for many years moving forward, I would retell the story about the day me and my friends went out, played some baseball, and lightning struck the baseball in the middle of the sky. But I'm going to be honest with you, I think over time the story will probably evolve. And I'll tell you what I mean. I will remember for all time that the baseball was hit by lightning. I don't know that I'll remember the fact that Chris did it. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think what will happen is, is I'll go from me, Chris, and Jacob were messing around, someone hit the ball, to it will evolve to me, Chris, me and a couple of my friends were out there messing around. And I think eventually the story ends with, I was out there one day and got a hold of a ball, and I hit it 400 foot, and this is what happened, right? So, so this is the story, this is what happens, but now let's reverse it a little bit. I'm going to give you a different scenario. So me, Chris, and Jacob, we're out there. We're about to play. Chris walks up to the plate, 
And Chris stops us before anything happens, and he goes, here's what's going to happen now. And I'll make fun of him. Um, and then he's going to go, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to let you throw two pitches at me. I'm going to look at two of them. On the third pitch, <laughs> what's going to happen is, is I'm going to hit a 400-foot bomb into the sky. And as that ball is sailing through the sky, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, lightning is going to strike that ball, and that ball is going to explode, and that's what's going to happen. So go ahead and pitch the first ball. I would look at Jacob, and I would go, yeah, he's from California. What a weirdo, right? There's no ways this is happening. I would throw the first two balls at him, and he would miss them as I would think he would. And when he gets a hold of that third one, and I hear the crack of that bat, and I whip my head around, and that ball is flying through the sky, and out of nowhere, lightning strikes the ball, and it explodes after Chris, who's like four foot three, told me <laughs> that he was going to do it. I am telling you right now, this is, this is my response to that. I'm not running up to Jacob and Chris, jumping up and down doing this. I'm stopping dead in my tracks. I'm looking back at Chris, and this is what I'm thinking. Who are you? All of a sudden, the fact that the baseball was struck by lightning is almost a secondary thing to who are you that can predict what is miraculously going to happen in the future? You see, all of a sudden... We move from that was a cool out of the ordinary thing that happened to I am looking at a person that has the kind of authority, the kind of power, and the kind of mystery around him that he can not only predict what's going to happen in the future, but now I can't help but ask myself, did Chris summons the lightning that hit the baseball? Who am I dealing with right now? And all of a sudden, there'll be a sense of awe and fear around Chris. And then the very next thing I would do is I would go to Chris and go, what are the lottery numbers today? Can you just scribble it on this napkin for me? I want to make you two promises. Promise number one, I will never tell that story without bringing Chris into the story. Why? Because Chris is the story now. It's not just about the miraculous taking place, but it's about Chris being the author of the miraculous. And I'll tell you another thing. Not only will I not forget that Chris was in the story, but I will listen to what Chris has to say from that day moving forward. So here's the thing that I want you to understand. It's not just that Jesus was involved in a miracle. It's the authority, it's the power, it's the fact that he predicted it, it's the fact that it came true, it's the fact that he is the author and he is the finisher of our faith. He is the one that calls down the rain and it rains. When Jesus speaks, we listen. Why? Because he has authority and he has incredible power. I want to close today by speaking to a specific group of people in the room, and I want to I wanna encourage you right now to raise your expectations. Maybe your expectations have been death coming into the service today, but Jesus can do far and beyond your expectations. I want you to know that He has conquered, He has defeated death on your behalf, and now I want you to understand that you need to take His very words very seriously because He is the author of life, and the, the group I want to speak to is Essentially, two, two groups of people, and it's the, the group that is sick and tired. <laughs> I'm just sick and tired. I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And if you're in this place today, and you are sick and tired, Jesus would say this to you. Mark 2, verses 17, and in this moment, Jesus is hanging out with a, a bunch of tax collectors and a bunch of sinners Jesus is hanging out with a whole bunch of people he probably should not be hanging out with. And he's asked the question, why are you hanging out with these people? This is what Jesus said. It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. I want you to know today that if you're in this place and you are sick, and honestly, you are sick because of the sin in your life. You have been running around like crazy trying to fix the problem. 
You know that eternity is written on your heart. It echoes in your heart. But death has been real and it has been speaking to you and you have adapted your life to the expectation of death rather than the expectation of life. But I want to tell you that Jesus has come for you. Jesus loves you. Jesus is here for you today no matter how far gone you might believe that you are. Hear me today. If Jesus can climb out from the grave and defeat death, He can absolutely lift you out of the ditch that you might find yourself in this morning. So I speak to the sinners and the sick today. Maybe you're in this place and you're just plain tired. I'm sick and I am tired. I am tired of running around. I'm tired of trying to figure it out by myself. I'm tired of carrying all the pressure on my own shoulders. I've tried to fix this and I've tried to fix that. And I'm trying so hard to live the abundant life, but I keep failing. I am tired. Listen to what Jesus would say to you this morning. Matthew 11, verses 28. Come to me. All, everybody, every one of you, you all qualify. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened. And what does he say? I will give you rest. The same Jesus that says they will kill me and I will get up out of the grave after three days. That same Jesus says to you this morning, if you're sick and if you're tired, come to me. I will give you abundant life. You can trust in me. You can believe in me because I love you. So let's get real practical as we close this morning. What does that mean? So how do I experience this rest, this healing, this restoration, this deliverance? How do I experience the salvation of the Lord? Jesus is reaching out to me right now. How do I experience it? And one time Jesus was in a conversation with a religious man. And this is how it goes. John 3 verses 1 to 6. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, Very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Who is it saying this? The one who conquered death is the one who is speaking these words to you now. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying that you must be born again. Jesus says that if you have been living in your sin and death, you need a fresh start. You need redemption. You need to be born again. So how do we do that? What does that look like? He says it happens by the Spirit and by water. So the first thing this morning is this. What does it mean to be born of the Spirit? It means that we believe and we trust in Jesus. It means we receive His forgiveness in our lives. We acknowledge the fact that we're not perfect. We acknowledge the fact that we are sinners. And we go, Lord, with my heart, with my soul, with my spirit, I believe in You. And I believe in Your promise. And then Jesus says, be born of water. And He's speaking about being baptized.